Hey guys, Dr. Anderson here. I wanted to go over just some of the things that might be causing your irritable bowel syndrome. So irritable bowel syndrome is going to affect about 10 to 20 percent of the population and I would suggest it's probably going to keep on increasing for the next few years here uh, because of a lot of factors. But probably the most important thing that you know about your irritable bowel syndrome is, is the cause of it really has to do with total inflammation of that gut lining. And there's a lot of things that can, that can cause inflammation of the gut lining and, and really the topic can get pretty complex. But on the simplest level, the things that you have to worry about is number one, an inflammatory diet. So the standard American diet of highly processed, high, highly refined carbs and just uh, not really paying attention to what you eat, just eating because it's there and it's fast and it's easy is no longer sufficient and maybe never was sufficient actually to keep that gut lining healthy. There's a lot of toxic insults that we get throughout the day and throughout the week and those factors um, really create a lot of inflammation of that gut lining. So what happens is once you have that inflammation of that gut lining, if it doesn't adequately repair, and it can repair very well, it can do that very quickly in as short as 48 to 72 hours, you can actually get all the inflammation out of your gut. It's possible, difficult but possible. Um, but if, if that gut doesn't repair adequately, what you're going to find is that you have to um, you have to decrease your inflammation in your in your diet and and through other factors. So what what are really so let's say you're someone that's already kind of working on the diet, you already eat kind of healthy. Uh, maybe you're eating a whole foods based diet already. You know what would be your next story? So the number one thing that I'm going to suggest in my office that I find currently all the time is stealth infection. And and what is a stealth infection? So stealth infection in general um, has to do with um, an infection that you really don't feel the symptoms of. For example, if you were to catch a cold, you might have symptoms of a fever or chills. Most people know when they catch a cold. Or if you have a bacterial infection, you might have um, pus or oozing or a super high temperature. Those would all be signs of a bacterial infection. But these stealth infections, they don't really present that way. So they present in a way that um, can be different from anything else. So in other words, you know, for, for me, if you look at the acronyms there I have, it's SIBO and CIFO, that's small intestine bacterial overgrowth and small intestine fungal overgrowth. If you look at those two factors, bacteria and fungus, these don't necessarily present in the same way um, that your typical common cold or common flu virus might present. So you might experience SIBO as knee pain. You may experience CIFO as headaches, brain fog, fatigue, um, and these are not typical symptoms that we associate um, as far as diagnostically in traditional medicine. We don't associate them with, with infection. But the reality is, if you think about when you have a cold, you will always have some fatigue, some brain fog, some lack of energy. So what we're missing here is we're missing some of the diagnosis there. Um, we're, we're missing some of the lab tests still to really get some great SIBO information, CIFO information, and even chronic low-grade viral infections are hard to detect. Um, you also have parasitic, in, uh, parasitic, you have parasitic infection that we're having a hard time finding in people um, as far as lab testing, or it may take multiple rounds of lab testing in order to discover that you have a parasite there. Um, then the second thing that I would say is most common in my office is some kind of food reaction. So we don't call these necessarily food allergies. You'll see allergies at the bottom there, but we don't call them necessarily food allergies. But, but essentially you're reacting to something that you're putting in your mouth. And that, that thing that you put in your mouth can be a food sensitivity, um, which is kind of a new topic, maybe slightly controversial, but really people know that they have these, right? So you eat something and it doesn't make you feel well. It could be something as simple as like a strawberry you eat and you don't feel well. Um, or you just know there's a certain food that you stay away from. And why do you stay away from that food? Well, it just doesn't make you feel well after you eat it. That would be a sensitivity versus like a true allergy, which would maybe cause some kind of rash or histamine response. I put chemical reactions there because I actually think we're all having a lot of chemical reactions these days. And these chemical reactions really have to do with nutrient deficiencies throughout our body or enzymatic deficiencies that we have to that, that we don't have in order to process certain nutrients. So essentially you could eat any food and it could be really healthy for you, but if you're lacking the B vitamins to activate the enzyme to, to enzymatically enhance a reaction, then you're gonna find that you don't tolerate that food very well. So you may not have a sensitivity as much as you may have some kind of chemical reaction that's not optimal in the body. And if it's not optimal in the body, then you'll start to have more and more food sensitivities or, or adverse reactions to these foods. And so what I, what I really harp on in my office is if we can address these two major factors, 
reducing food reactions and reducing stealth infections or infections that we have in, in our digestive tract that don't present as common signs and symptoms, you're going to find that most cases of IBS can actually resolve and a lot of people actually feel significantly better in short periods of time. Now, in traditional medicine right now, we don't have a causative factor, and there's a reason why. There's multiple factors that cause IBS, and anything that causes inflammation can create that IBS story. But what I found in my office that these two things are probably the most important for greater than 90% of my patients um, who have chronic or even short-term irritable bowel syndrome. Thanks.